One of the things I love about my mom is the constant patience and just willingness to deal with whatever I've thrown at her and still love me in spite of all of that. One thing I love about my mom is the courageous love that she puts forward in her relationships. She's not afraid to bend over backwards for the people that she cares about, and that's something I aspire to do in my everyday life. I love my mom because she is determined, hardworking, and never gave up on me when I gave up on myself. So, love you, Mom. The best thing about my mom is that she is for sure her own person. She marches to the beat of her own drum, um, definitely a leader, and has taught me to never be a follower. Happy Mother's Day. Mom, I just want to tell you I'm the woman I am today because of your influence and your love. And to my mother in love, Brenda, you are a gift to me and to our family. Happy Mother's Day to both of you. I love you so very much. And to all the moms out there, the moms, the bonus moms, the grandmothers, the aunts, the friends, you are an important part of the next generation and we are so grateful for your support. I want to wish my mom I want to wish my mother-in-law, I want to wish all those amazing ladies through the years who acted like a mom in my life, and to all you moms who are on active duty today, a very blessed and happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms. We love you. Thank you for all you've done. You're a blessing to every one of us. We hope you have a wonderful day. Get lots of rest and uh, enjoy your day. Hey moms, thank you so much for pouring into our students here at Christ Church. You are making a difference and an impact in this generation. Uh, we love you. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to the mothers near and far. We love you and appreciate all of you for all your hard work. From Christ Church to all the moms, we love you. Happy Mother's Day. We love you. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Love you a lot. I love you, Mommy. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you, moms. Happy Mother's Day. Moms, happy Mother's Day. Thank you so much for everything that you do for us. We love you. Oh, isn't that cute? Come on now. <laughs> He's one of those two cute kids in there, man. That just brought it home, right? Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. Moms, welcome. Happy Mother's Day. So glad that you are here with us today. And Hopefully you felt honored today. Hopefully you feel loved today. Hopefully you feel appreciated today. And so moms, thank you for not just giving us life, but help us to become the best that we can be. And so moms, let's give a round of applause for all of our moms out there. Hey, and let me take advantage of this moment, if you will. Hey mom, I know you watch every single week. And so uh, thank you for being my number one fan. Thank you for, for always putting me in positions that can help me become who God created me to be. And I know so many times that involved incredible sacrifice on your part, but thank you so much because I get to be who I am and do what God called me to do, and you're a huge part of that. So mom, thank you. Give my mom a round of applause, would you? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, welcome to Christ Church. I'm so glad that you are here today. If you're new around here, my name's Jason. I'm one of the pastors on staff. And every week I get the privilege of, of opening up God's word and being able to apply it to your life. And so if you wanna get connected, you wanna meet someone around here, you wanna take a next step around here, an easy way to do that is to just take a photo of this uh, QR code that we're gonna throw up on the screen behind me. It's gonna take you to this page. We're just gonna ask you three questions. Fill those out, uh, we'll get a little reply back to you. Take that reply to a hub at the campus you're attending and we'll give you a free gift and you'll get to meet some of my great teammates uh, and share with you what God is doing around here. And listen, if you're a part of the CC family, you're a part of this faith family, we always encourage you to, to be generous. And I just wanna say thank you for your generosity, whether you give just randomly throughout the, the month or maybe you give a set amount or maybe you like to give above and beyond. However you give around here, however you express your generosity, Thank you. Your generosity keeps this church out in the forefront, being salt and light. And so you can give around here week in, week out through either the white envelopes that are in the chairs uh, at every campus, online, of course, or through a couple of our different uh, electronic devices around our campuses. Now, where we're going to be today is in a really unique passage of Scripture, and we haven't been in this book of the Bible for a while. We're going to be in the book of Romans today. So if you have your Bibles, your devices, love for you to open up to the book of Romans. Romans is the sixth book in the New Testament. So you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the Gospels. Those are the stories about Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then you have the book of Acts. 
And that's the story of the church, the history of the church. And then after Acts, you have these letters that Paul wrote to various churches throughout Asia and Asia Minor. And we're gonna begin in that sixth book today, we're gonna look at the sixth book, in a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Rome. And so while you're finding Romans chapter 15, let me ask you a question. And it's okay to answer yes to this, all right? I'm just gonna say that right off the bat. It's okay to answer yes because my answer already is yes. Has anybody, has anybody truthfully sat down and watched any of this court case between Johnny Depp and Amber Heard? Anybody else, is it just me? Oh my goodness, right? I mean, you talk about a train wreck, holy cow. I mean, cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Now, now, don't hear me wrong, there are some serious allegations in the middle of this, but all around it, oh my goodness. I mean, I just wanna grab my popcorn and Twizzlers and sit down and watch this thing. And, I'm still not convinced that they haven't been hired by Netflix and this is actually a reality show that they're putting on for us because it is an example of what happens when relationships go really, really bad. And I don't know who they've been getting relationship advice from, but they need to quit. So, so Johnny Amber, if you're out there and you're watching or you're listening today, quit listening to all those people and maybe you need to join us on Friday night for our date night for married couples, right? And so Friday night here at Mandarin Campus, Friday the 13th, we're gonna have a marriage workshop. Like, who came up with that day, right? And Jason's gonna be hosting it. It makes it even worse. We're gonna have it at Camp Crystal Lake, even worse. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But we're gonna get together here at the Mandarin Campus and we're just gonna spend some time together, eat, and we're gonna be pouring into marriages. And so I wanna encourage you, if you haven't signed up yet, I think before service, we had like 60 couples already signed up. And so that's gonna be this coming Friday night. And so please get your registration in ASAP. Uh, so if you're engaged or you're married, show up there Wednesday night. If you're single, a young adult, we have a great opportunity for you, living single, coming up this Wednesday night. And so for both of those, you might wanna get your registration in ASAP. And, and what we're gonna be doing is continuing to look at some of these principles that the Bible points out. We're in this series called One Another. Look at these different principles that the Bible points out about how we're supposed to live with one another and have great relationships with one another. And it's been really interesting because I've had several conversations of people going, Hey, Pastor, I, I didn't think that's what this series was gonna be about. I mean, I thought this was gonna be one of those relationship series where you kind of told some funny stories and we joked and laughed. You gave us a principle, a couple passages, gave us some application, and we went on our merry way. But this hasn't been a series like that. Because what we've been doing is looking at God's word, at these six key principles that scripture points about, out about how we are to treat one another. And out of these one another principles, that's where we get the behaviors and the attitudes and the actions that we need to have healthy, strong, vibrant relationships. And so as we begin this journey, week one, we start with the very first one. It was love one another. In fact, say that with me on the count of three. One, two, three, love one another. I mean, this one is the glue. I mean, this is what holds everything together. I mean, this is what gives birth to all the other principles that we're going to be talking about. Everything's gonna pass away, but the one thing that's gonna last forever is love. And so love is the, the birth of these other ones. Love gives us the ability to do these ones that we're talking about, especially the one last week was our second one, which was forgive one another. And some of you are still like holding a grudge against me for even bringing it up last week. So please forgive me, because again, I'm just reading the words the words of Jesus, and, and I know there's been some hard conversations had. I know there's been some soul searching just from my groups and the people I've been talking to over the past week. I know that the Holy Spirit challenged us in our spirits to maybe take a step, maybe take a courageous step to either go and asking for forgiveness or, or offering forgiveness to someone in our life because we've been holding on. And, and let me tell you what's gonna happen if you hold on to that, 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 that resentment in you. It's kind of like termites eating a tree. Well, what happens is on the outside, I mean, everything looks fine, but on the inside, they begin to eat that tree from the inside out. And that's what unforgiveness, that's what resentment will do to you if you hold on to it. It's gonna eat you up from the inside out. And so forgiveness is all about releasing that resentment. And so last week, you didn't take a step. Last week, maybe you made a couple excuses. Or last week, you said, you know what? I wanna get around to it. Man, I'm telling you, maybe God brought you here last week to put that in front of you and to challenge you. And so if you didn't do it last week, hey, you can still do that anytime, anyway. 
And so I wanna encourage you to take that, that bold, courageous step. And so love one another, forgive one another, and then this week, accept one another. Accept one another. And this one, let me just tell you, it's complicated. I mean, this one is complex. This one has got all these different ins and outs and nuances, but this one is so key and so important to to lasting, healthy relationships. But there's one word, one thing that makes this one so difficult, and it's this word, fear. Fear. And when I talk about fear, I'm not talking about those external fears. I'm not talking about like, I'm scared of spiders, scared of snakes, I'm, I'm scared of public speaking, or I'm scared of heights. I'm not talking about those external kind of fears. I'm talking about those internal fears. You know, like the fear of failure. I mean, I, I don't wanna fail my parents, or I don't wanna fail my kids. I, I don't wanna fail my spouse. I don't wanna fail my boss or my team. I mean, I, I don't wanna make such a mistake. I don't wanna be known as a failure. It's the fear of failure. Or or maybe for you, it's the fear of obscurity. That that you're going through life, like what is my life about? What is my purpose for me? Am I doing anything meaningful? Am I doing anything that's gonna make a difference? Am I just making widgets day in and day out? I mean, if I died and left, would anybody even miss me? I I mean, obscurity, internal fears. But I think it's this internal fear that's what makes this one that we're talking about today, acceptance, so difficult. And that's the fear of rejection. The fear of rejection. And I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand if you've ever been rejected, because I know every single person in here has felt rejection, the sting and the pain and the trauma of being rejected. Now, I talked to a couple people this week and asked, but hey, when did it start for you? I mean, what moment in life, and, and you know, there's a lot of different answers, but it seemed like there was one moment in time that this whole idea of rejection began to, to come to the surface. And almost everyone said, you know what? Where it started for me, it was in middle school. It was in middle school. You know middle school, it's those weird, awkward years where your body is growing and, and doing all these weird things and it's misshapen as it's trying to get to its full form and all of a sudden all those you know, hormones inside of you start to fire off and, and you're getting acne and your voice is cracking and, and all of a sudden now you're wrestling with trying to be an individual yet still trying to fit in and now you don't know how to interact with the opposite sex and it's just this weird season of life where things don't make sense and it's awkward and the boys are all like Beavis and Butthead, uh-huh, uh-huh. and the girls are like sharks with blood in the water. I mean, it's just a weird season of life. And to make that season so much more difficult, and parents, we don't understand because we didn't grow up with a stupid phone in our hand. We didn't grow up with that. And these middle schoolers are wrestling with all these crazy things happening in their lives, and all of a sudden, we put a stupid phone in their hand, give access to our kid's soul in their hands, and they open up that social media, and they're rejected time and time and time again. But it doesn't stop in middle school, does it? It continues on to high school. Is is she gonna say yes? Is he gonna ask me out? Am I gonna get a a date to the the dance, to prom? Am Am I gonna make the homecoming court? Am I going to get into the school of my dreams or I'm going to be waitlisted or rejected? And we can become a young adult and it's trying to find Mr. Right or Mrs. Right, swipe right, swipe left. Will you go out with me? No. Will you go out with me? No. And then looking for that perfect job. I mean, that's it. No, you didn't get the job. You didn't get the role you wanted. And then you find what you think is Mr. Right or Mrs. Right, and you begin this whole relationship thing. And it's the fear of, are the in-laws going to accept me? You know, am I, gonna, am I gonna experience rejection from my spouse? One day are my kids gonna reject me? Or moms, I mean, it's the whole mom shame thing. Are the other moms gonna reject me because my kids act up? I mean, moms, if we all would just be honest with one another, that our kids aren't always little angels, sometimes they're little monsters, everyone would be happy, right? And so moms, we love you, but take it easy on one another because our kids make mistakes. That's part of growing up. And so it's the fear of fitting in as a, as a parent or a mom. But then we take that and we put it on our heavenly father. I mean, he could never love me because of what I've done. I Man, I don't think there's any way he could forgive me for the pain and trauma that I've caused in, in so many people's lives. Maybe you heard this one, man, if I walk through the doors of that church, whoo, I mean, God would throw like lightning bolts down. The earth would split up and gobble me up because I am such a sinner. And I used to think that that wasn't a thing until I had that happen in my extended family. 
You see, there's somebody in my extended family that you know, claims that they don't believe in, in organized religion, that they believe that there's something out there. They would say they're agnostic. And, and so they're always anti against the church, anti against me and my job, and you know, all kinds of those type of things. But every Easter, they would agree because it's what people do on Easter to go to church. And, and she would get dressed and all gussied up and get in the car and complain all the way to church. I mean, I can't believe this. Can't, they're going to ask for money and, and blah, blah, blah. And I can't believe it. And one year on Easter, she all dressed up and she's walking up the steps going into the church and the church that they attended was one of these big white churches with a big white steeple with all the steps going up to it. You can probably picture it. And as she's walking up the steps into that church, complaining about church, she falls and breaks her leg. Oh, I know, I know. it's funny now, years later, all right? But oh my goodness, I'm like, oh, he does do that, all right? <laughs> he does that. So, so anyway, you know, no, but so many times people go, you know what, is, is God gonna accept me? I mean, I've been bad, I've done things, and I've walked away, and I've dishonored him, and I've ignored him. I mean, is God going to reject me like my earthly father rejected me? I mean, we all have experienced that pain of rejection. We've all experienced the hurt that happens in our hearts when instead of being embraced, we're ostracized. I mean, you have your list, right? Because we've experienced it in our, in our homes, we've experienced it in our schools, we've experienced it at work, in our jobs, we've experienced it in our relationships and friendships. Maybe we've even experienced it within a church. I know I got a list. You know my story, you know where I'm going first. My dad walking out when I was seven. Didn't see him for 14 years. No letters, no cards on my birthday, no gifts at Christmas. And then one day, a few years later, going to court, they read a letter saying, your dad is, doesn't want you. Just sign away all of his rights to be known as your father. And you talk about rejection. And I'll never forget when I decided to go into ministry between my, my freshman and sophomore year of college and I go back to school, go back to Indiana, and I'm telling my teammates, hey, I, you know, I'm leaving, I'm gonna go to Bible college. And they look at me like I got three eyes. Like, are you kidding me? You're leaving the team, you're leaving everything we're doing, you're leaving training, and you're doing that to go to Bible college? I've been trying to explain to my fraternity guys, you know, the guys in the fraternity, like, you're, you're, you're passing up your bid for Bible college? I mean, seriously? And in that moment, when I make that decision, going from these friends and these teammates to longer friends and teammates, and the rejection because I made a decision. I mean, what's your list? I mean, I guarantee you have a list of, of, of things that, that, that people have done to you, the rejection that you have felt when, when you felt like you should have been embraced, but you weren't embraced. The Bible is clear. We're to accept one another. Accept one another. And so let's just jump into the Word of God and see what the Apostle Paul writes about this because again, it's complicated, it's complex, it's got some nuances and we're gonna do our best to unpack this topic today and honestly, they probably need four or five weeks but I'll do my best to get it done here in 30 minutes. And so let's see what the Apostle Paul writes. It begins here in chapter 15. It says this. It said, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement. And let me pause right there. How many of us right now would say, man, I need some endurance and I need some encouragement. Anybody else? And some of you are going, man, it's been a hard couple years. I mean, it's been so challenging and so difficult in every area of my life. And there's been times I felt like just throwing in the towel. There's been times I felt like just walking away. And man, I just need some endurance. I just need something to remind me to, to hold on, to keep at it. And I need some encouragement. It seems like everywhere I turn, it's negative and bad and divisive. And, and even when I come to church, it's like, where are all my friends? Where are all the people that I used to see? I mean, where are they gone? And, and you hear stories and you're like, man, what is going on? Is God still out there? Is God still active? Is God doing anything? You need a little bit of encouragement? Let me give you some encouragement this morning. You know, over the past several weeks, we've seen so many people making decisions for Jesus Christ. Not a week goes by where we're not talking, we're not taking serious conversational time with people in our church making spiritual decisions. Just last Sunday in this service, you saw a brother and sister who watch on our online community come in to be baptized last week. I mean, just a couple weeks ago on Easter Sunday, 55 people in one day. I mean, our, our, our kids' ministry, CC Kids and our student ministry is growing leaps and bounds. And as you look around this place week after week, you're seeing so many faces that you haven't seen and so many new faces. I'm telling you, church, God is doing a new thing. 
and he's moving and he's active. So hold on, hold on, be encouraged. And so he says, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had. So that with one mind and one voice, how many minds? One. How many voices? One. With one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says here the same attitude, the same mind, the same voice as Jesus Christ. And where is that mind? Where is that attitude? Where is that voice aimed? At other people. At other people. You see, one mind plus one voice equals one God. When we operate as a faith family, as the church of Jesus Christ, as the bride, when we have one mind and one voice, we glorify our one God. And people can't help but want to be a part of it. And so when we have one attitude, one mind, one voice, we give glory to our Father and people are drawn to that. And so verse 7, here's what he says. So accept one another. Say accept one another. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. Accept one another. How? How? As our culture accepts one another, as society accepts one another, as our world accepts one another, as you would accept one another, as others accept one another, no, as Jesus accepts one another. If I was to summarize this whole entire message, it's simple, accept one another as Jesus has accepted you. And when you do that, you heap praise on our Heavenly Father. Now, anytime you look at scripture, it's always important to look at the context. Because this is where so many people maybe misapply what Paul is writing. Paul is writing to the church, a family of believers, the faith family. And he's talking about issues within the walls of the church. He isn't necessarily addressing, well, how you deal with people outside. He's addressing how you deal with people inside, how you deal with one another. And so it's so important for us to not misapply this. Yes, there is an application for what he's saying for, for the church and those out in the world, but his primary concern is how we treat one another. And he's saying we need to accept one another. And when we have that one mind and we have that one voice and we give glory to God. And so, so many times teachers or pastors stop at verse seven, but we need to keep reading because verses eight and nine, they give us the context I think we truly need. And so listen to what he writes as he continues. Verse eight says, for I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed and moreover that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. And so again, let me address this. It came up last week. I wanna address it again when it comes to God's chosen people. I mean, so many times we've heard that and we read that throughout scripture, God's chosen people, God's chosen people. And up to the time of Jesus, we know who God's chosen people are. It's the Jews, it's the Israelites. God made a covenant with Abraham and, I, and, and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph to multiply their numbers, to give them this promised land. There was a covenant that God made with the patriarchs. And so they were his chosen people, his chosen vessel to bring Jesus into the world. But when Jesus died on the cross, when Jesus gave his life and paid the price for your sins and my sins, he didn't just pay the price for the Jews. He paid the price for everybody. And so that when Jesus died on the cross, that the Gentiles then are grafted in to the family of God. And so the church, the bride of Christ, the hope of the world now is God's chosen people. And so we all, as we accept Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, become a part of the chosen people. People. And again, remember, Paul's writing to the church in Rome. And the church in Rome wasn't just a bunch of, of Jews who had transplanted in the city of Rome. I mean, and when he's writing this, it's not writing to, to just a bunch of Roman citizens. No, the church in Rome was made up of all kinds of people. There were Romans there. There were Greeks there. There were Jews there. There were people from all around the world. It was a cosmopolitan town. And so he's writing to a group of people that were incredibly diverse 
being young and old, rich and poor, educated, uneducated, male and female, citizen and saint, sinner, unclean, pure, follower of Jesus, all of those people were there. And please hear me when I say this, there is no distinction in the church of Jesus Christ. We are all one. We are all his children. That is what the Bible is clear, and it says to us that there is no distinction within the church of Jesus Christ. And that is why, absolutely, we should applaud for that. Because that is such hopeful news for us, no matter where we come from, no matter our background. You see, that's why we must love one another. It is why we must, we must forgive one another. It's why we must accept one another, because that's not going to happen in the world. That's not gonna happen in our culture. Then that's not going to happen in, in, our, in our gender. It's not going to happen in our sexuality. It's not going to happen in our political party. It's not going to happen in our race. But the church of Jesus Christ is the one place that was created by God for that to happen every single time. For everyone to be accepted. But when the church doesn't do that, when the church doesn't do what it was designed and created to do, then we just look like the world. We look like the culture. We look like a country club. You see, the church is the hope of the world. The church is the bride of Christ. The church is supposed to be holy and distinct and set apart. The church is supposed to be one. It's supposed to be unified. And we are supposed to be salt and we are supposed to be light. That is what God designed the church to be. And so Jesus accepts everyone. And we, in turn, need to do the same. And so how do we kind of take this topic and, and make some sense of it? Because there is a lot of different nuances to this. And so here's what I wanna do. I wanna go through Jesus's life and look at a couple of different examples of different types of people that many times were rejected by the community, but Jesus accepted. And so let me jump into a couple of these. First one off the bat is this, Jesus accepted the sinner. Jesus accepted the sinner. Listen to what it says in Luke chapter five, verse 30. It said, but the Pharisees and their teachers of religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples. Why do you eat and drink with such scum? So what you have here is a bunch of church people complaining. Here's my shocked face. I can't believe they painted the church that color. I can't believe that they put that carpet in. Man, they switched from pews to chairs. I mean, who picked that music, right? I mean, I can't believe church people are complaining. But do you catch what they're complaining about? It's not about how things look. They're complaining about people. And did you hear the adjective that they used? Scum. Scum. I mean, what do you think of when you think of scum? I'll tell you what I think of. I think of like that, that nasty buildup on the shower door, right? I think of after you do dishes in the sink, all that stuff that's left in that little drain. That, yeah, ooh, you're exactly right. I mean, I think, when I think of scum, that's what I think of. It's waste, it's garbage, it's gross, it's filthy, it's unclean. That's the word they were using to describe these people that Jesus was hanging out with. I mean, and I don't know what translation of Bible you're reading right now. I mean, some other translations say, you know, it's, it's sinners and tax collectors. And I always get the center part, but why tax collectors? Why pick on a profession? I mean, why in the world are they always picking on a tax collector? I mean, why not, you know, well, sinners and teachers or sinners and police officers or, or sinners and pastors or, or sinners and lawyers. Now that one works maybe, I don't know, all right? But, but they're always picking on these tax collectors. And let me just tell you why, because it's gonna pop up a couple times today. You see, tax collectors were hated for two reasons. Number one, they were working for Rome, taking from their fellow countrymen. You see, Rome put these heavy taxes on the people of Israel, and they hired Israelites to take the money from their own people, so they were traitors. But here's what they also did. If they were being charged 7%, these tax collectors would charge 8.5. They would line their own pockets. So they were traitors, and they were thieves. And so they were hated people. They said, sinners are bad, but whoa, a tax collector is worse. And so here in this passage, what you see is, is them describing the people that Jesus is hanging out with, these sinners, as scum, as scum. 
But the church should be the most accepting place on the planet because Jesus was the most accepting person who ever walked the planet. Now, some of you right now are going, but, 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 hold on to your butts for a couple minutes, all right? I told you this is complex and difficult. So just hold on to it. I'll get to your butt in just a minute because there is a butt here. But here's the truth. The church should be accepting because Jesus was accepting. And how many times, I cannot tell you how many times that people come to me and say, Pastor, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm okay with Jesus, but I'm not a fan of his people. Man, I'm okay with the church, but man, those, those Christians, not so much. And I cannot tell you how many times I've seen people and talked to people who said, I have rejected God, I have rejected Jesus. I have rejected the church because I have felt rejected by God's people. It breaks my heart. It breaks my heart when I hear that. But let me just say this, and this is a little soapbox for me, all right? Because listen, let me go ahead and break this to you. This isn't a perfect church. If you came in here today and you're church shopping, let me just go ahead and ruin it right now. This is not a perfect church. You go, well, why not? Well, the reason why is because I'm here. All right, and because you're here. Because we're all here, we're not perfect. I'm a mess, you're a mess, we're all a mess. I'm not perfect, you're not perfect, we're not perfect. I'm gonna fail, you're gonna fail, we're all going to fail one another. But that doesn't mean you just stop going to church. I mean, how many of you felt rejected at school sometime? Probably about every one of us, multiple times, right? I mean, how many of you have ever felt rejected at work? Odds are about every single one of us. And so let me ask you the follow-up question. Did you stop going to school? <laughs> Did you stop going to work? No. And so why in the world do we hold the church to an unrealistic, unbiblical standard? And we go, you know what? Someone at church hurt me. I'm done with the church. I am out. No. The church is supposed to be the most accepting place on the planet. It's why it was created. But I know, I know sometimes even within the walls of the church, can feel rejection. Listen, even as a pastor, I feel that. Yeah, I get, I get a lot of praise and I get a, little, a lot of compliments because of my role and my position, but man, I get a lot of the other too. And, and, and I'm real, I'm human, and it hurts when I hear it. I mean, I, I hear the stories or I hear the, the, the messages that make it back out, oh, so-and-so left this church or so-and-so mad because of something Jason said or because of what Jason did or our decision Jason, man, I hear that. And I'm not just so crass, go, well, who cares? You know, we're better off without him. No, I got a heart. I'm a servant. I'm a pleaser by nature. And so it stings and it's hard. And I'll never forget one thing my predecessor, Dennis Bratton, told me. He said, you know what? When, when you take this job, you're gonna have to become like an M&M. I'm like, M&M? Explain that, please. He said, well, you're gonna have to develop a hard outer shell, but remain soft on the inside because you're gonna get the attacks, you're gonna get the complaints, and people are going to, to say things, and you're just gonna have to learn to, to let it roll off a little bit, but never get so hard-hearted that you don't love and serve people. And I love that I look around this, this room, I look around this church, and, and I know there's people out here that I've had disagreements with, people that have been mad at me about certain things, and we've sat down and we've had conversations, and maybe you've been left for a while, but now you're back. And we have this great relationship because we were honest with one another. And, and so, so we loved one another enough to, to, to forgive one another and accept one another. And, and so I love that I get to serve at a church where, where that's what we have here, is we have a bunch of people who realize they're not perfect. And, and you love and, and forgive and accept me and I love and forgive and accept you. And that's the way the church was supposed to be. And so G, listen to what Jesus says next as he responds to these people who are struggling with him hanging out with sinners. He says this, I, I love this, challenging words. Jesus answered them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. Healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. And he says, I have come to call not those who think, think that they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent, amen. But that word repent is key and it's gonna show up a couple times in our conversation today because here's the truth and this is hard for us to hear but there is no acceptance without repentance. There's no acceptance without repentance. I mean, Jesus invited everybody. Jesus loves everybody. Jesus accepts everybody but our responsibility is to accept him. 
to accept that free gift. If we want to be back into the loving embrace of our Heavenly Father, then we have to accept his gift of Jesus Christ. And so without acceptance, without repentance, we can't have that. And Jesus illustrated this several times in his ministry. Towards the end, he told this story to his disciples about one day he's gonna be in heaven, he's gonna be separating the sheep from the goats. And those goats are gonna think that they're sheep, but they're not really sheep, they're goats. And so some are gonna be divided and one's are, one are gonna go into eternal you know, bliss and, and connection and community with God forever and the others are gonna be separate out and have eternal separation from God. He, he tells another story about this, about this dad who's throwing a wedding and there's this incredible wedding and all these guests are invited and none of the guests show up. And so he tells the servant, go out into the streets Go to the alleys and the highways and the byways and and you invite everybody and everyone can come to this wedding and and everyone is invited and people show up but then the father comes around and decides who's in and who's out. You see, those who repent and those who accept the free gift are the ones who get to experience the acceptance of our heavenly father. And so Jesus came for everybody. Jesus loves everybody. Jesus accepts everybody but we have to repent to accept that gift. And so Jesus accepts sinners, but Jesus also accepts outcasts. Jesus accepts outcasts. And let's go back to those, those notorious sinners, the scum. Let's go back to those, those tax collectors. And who's the most famous tax collector in the Bible? He was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. And one day he climbed up in a tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And yes, that's an old children's song for some of you going, what is he talking about? And so Jesus is coming through this town and and this tax collector climbs up in a tree. And Luke 19 records this. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and he called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. And so Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people, here we go again, but the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. And there again, another description of these people, these outcasts, a notorious sinner. I mean, Zacchaeus was a well-known thief. He was a well-known turncoat. It's the reason why nobody would let him get a a front row seat of this parade as Jesus is coming to town. He had to climb up in a tree. But what we see in this text is Jesus meets us where we are, even up in a tree. And here is this guy, Zacchaeus, who is is a thief and a traitor. And Jesus goes to his house. I love the fact that Jesus points out here that if you're an outcast, then he's gonna meet you where you are and he's not gonna send you off. You go get cleaned up first and then you can come to me. Hey, you go to church and you fill out that background check and you start to serve, you join a small group, you memorize the books of the Bible and then five years from now, then you can come to me. No, he says, you come to me now. Now he he meets us where we're at. And and so I love that about Jesus. He accepts the outcast, but we also see that Jesus accepts the unclean, the unclean. There's a couple of different illustrations of this. One day Jesus is walking through a crowd of people on his way to perform a miracle. And there's all these people bumping up against Jesus. And all of a sudden Jesus stops, says, somebody touched me. The disciples are like, well, of course they did. Look, you're in the middle of a crowd of people. They're all trying to get close to you. He's like, no, 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 somebody touched me because it was a different kind of touch and all of a sudden a woman falls to her knees and this woman who had been bleeding for 12 years and according to Jewish law if she is bleeding that means she is unclean and she would not be able to to go to church she would not be able to to practice any of her faith and so for for 12 years she's been isolated and alone on this day she touches Jesus and if you're unclean and you touch somebody else you make that person unclean and Jesus does not admonish her but Jesus shows compassion on her and heals her. I love Jesus and the kids. I mean, as a former children's pastor, I love this because as kids, man, they're just like little germ boxes running around, right? I mean, you have no idea where their hands have been, where they've crawled and dug and, and scratched and scraped, and, and they're little germ boxes. And, and there's a story where all the kids are running around Jesus, the disciples are like, get away, get away, get away. And she's like, no, nah, no, nah, bring those germ boxes to me. Put them on my lap. Let the kids come to me. And then there's another story, several of these examples of of Jesus interacting with these people who have leprosy. And if you had leprosy in that day and age, you were, you were removed from your home, you were removed from your church family, you were removed from your community, you were put in these isolated communities with nothing but a bunch of other lepers. And you just had to hold out hope that maybe somehow 
you're gonna be healed. And if you had leprosy and you happened to come in contact with people who did not have leprosy, it was your responsibility to yell out unclean, 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 to warn everybody that you were unclean. And can you imagine how much that must have hurt to yell those words? And one day Jesus comes into contact with a man with leprosy. It says a man with leprosy came and knelt in front of Jesus, begging to be healed. If you're willing, you can heal me and make me clean, he said. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said, be healed. And instantly the leprosy disappeared and the man was healed. What a moment where Jesus shows compassion we have no idea how long this man was struggling and suffering from, from this affliction of leprosy, but we know for, for more likely years that he had not felt compassion and the touch of another human being. And Jesus reaches out to touch this unclean man and heal him. What a powerful moment. So Jesus accepts the unclean, but we also know that Jesus accepted the criminal. We just go to the cross. Jesus wasn't crucified alone. The Bible says that there were two criminals crucified on either side of him. As the story goes, one of the criminals starts to, to, to heap insults on Jesus. Luke records this. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself. And while you're at it, us too. But the other criminal protested. Don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you today, you will be with me in paradise. I mean, this guy couldn't do anything. He couldn't come off the cross and, and, and go to church. He couldn't join a group. He couldn't come forward at the end of a service. Jesus met him where he was at. Listen, I just wanna say this for just a moment. I just wanna to speak to, to the guys at our prison ministry. Man, we love you guys. And I know there's so many times that you wrestle with the, the choices you've made and where you're at in life right now. But just hear me when I say this. Jesus accepts the prisoners. Jesus accepts those criminals. And I know you've made choices. I know you're paying the consequences of those but God is doing a new thing in you. You are a new creation in Christ. You've taken off those grave clothes and you put on those grace, grace clothes. So live it out every day. Live it out every day. Just know that Jesus is for you. We're for you too. Let's let them, let's let them hear at church that we're for them. One more thing, Jesus accepts the unworthy. I mean, the guy who's writing this text, Paul, wrestled with this his entire life. Because before he became known as the apostle, he was actually known as a murderer. I mean, this is the guy who worked for the religious people and he would go around and try to find those Christians and root them out and he would expose them. In fact, there's a, a, a text here in the book of Acts where it actually shows that there is, there is Paul and he's standing over a murder of a man, the martyr of a man by the name of Stephen. And one day on the road that he's on his way to, to find another Christian and out him, Jesus appears to him and changes the course of his life. But he never got over that. He never felt worthy enough. I mean, listen to his words as he shares these words with his young protege, Timothy. He says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. And even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. I mean, I don't know about you, but there are days I feel like I'm leading a parade, a parade of sinners, and I feel like I'm in the front with that baton and I'm just going to town. I mean, why do I do what I don't wanna do? Why, after all these years, why do I, I still not do what I know I'm supposed to do? I mean, I wrestle with that. Paul wrestled with that. But Jesus accepted those who felt unworthy. And so let's wrap up with a little bit of application. Man, I wish I had some more time on this one. Number one, here's some application. Jesus loves the world, but he's only accepting those who accept him. 
Jesus loves the world, Jesus came for the world, Jesus accepts everyone, but you have to accept Jesus. If you wanna spend eternity with your, your heavenly Father, if you want that eternal life and, and that cool place that, that he's over called heaven, then you have to accept that free gift of Jesus Christ. Jesus came for everyone, he loves everyone, but you have to accept Jesus. Number two, acceptance does not mean tolerance. I'm gonna slow down for a moment on this one. Acceptance does not mean tolerance. Yes, Jesus loves us. Yes, Jesus accepts us. But it doesn't mean we can bury our head in the sand and accept sinful lifestyles, false doctrines, or secular worldviews. Remember who he's talking to here. He's talking to, to those within the church. And so for those of us who live in the church, we can accept one another, and we can love one another, and we should always accept and love one another, but we've gotta draw a line in the sand when it comes to false doctrine, when it comes to secular worldviews, when it comes to, to sinful lifestyles. We gotta recognize that we can love everybody and we can accept everybody, but we can't affirm those things. And so we gotta be cautious but how we deal with them is where we get into so much trouble. And the Bible says when you deal with issues like this, he gave us Matthew 18, Jesus said, hey, here's a model to follow. When you deal with these issues, the Bible says, you know, it's this incredibly delicate balance, this tension between, between truth and grace. And so many times we wanna just err on the side of, well, we're gonna be over here and we're gonna be truthful and we kinda push the grace aside. Or sometimes we come over here and we're way too graceful and we push the, the truth aside. We've gotta live in that, that delicate balance, the tension between the two. But we, just because we accept everybody doesn't mean we have to affirm things that are not biblical. We gotta be cautious with that. And when those things come forward, we have to lovingly and gracefully and truthfully Deal with those things. One last point, the cross. It's the cross of Jesus. That's the bridge to our eternal acceptance. You see, one day, we're gonna be accepted forever. And the way that we see that and experience that is through the cross of Jesus Christ. We were separated. Our sins separated us from God and we were rejected because of our sinful nature. But God loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus who died on the cross, shed his blood so that, that he could build a bridge from this place of rejection to feel accepted and embraced. The cross is the bridge. The cross is the way we come home. The cross is the way we experience that eternal acceptance. And so church, this is a difficult one. This is a challenging one to accept one another. But Paul is so crystal clear. When you have one mind and you have one voice, you glorify that one God. And that's the way the church was designed to be. That's what God intended the church to be. The hope of the world, the bride of Christ, that with one voice, with one mind, that we would glorify our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And church... That's the call on us to accept one another as Jesus accepted you. Would you pray with me, Jesus? We come before you now and recognize that this one is just as challenging as the other two. I mean, so many times it's easy for us to draw lines in the sand. Sometimes it's easy for us to build walls. Sometimes it's easy for us to, to, to choose who gets to be in and who gets to be out but you're clear that within the family of God, we are all the same. We are all children of the Most High God, sons and daughters. We are one. Jesus, would you forgive us? We repent of sometimes the mess we've made of your church, bringing our flesh into something that is spirit-filled. Would you help us to love like you? to forgive like you, and to accept like you? Would you help us to apply that to our relationships with one another? Because Jesus, when we do, man, we are a powerful, powerful light in this world. And all we wanna do as your children is bring you glory. Jesus, we love you. And so less of me, more of you. It's in your name we pray, amen.